is also the sermon and the sentence. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's the phrase, the last phrase that we're going to focus in on. It's not full of grace and not full of truth. It's full of grace and full of truth. You know, that's the way that phrase lays out. Let's, let's roll through this phrase as well. Just as we use glory without defining it, we use grace without defining it as well. So we talk about God's grace without actually explaining what grace means. When we think of grace outside of the Bible, you either think it's somebody's name, it's a girl's name, right? Or it's connected somehow to dancing or being uh, dexterous, right? She, she has a lot of grace or he has a lot of grace. And neither of which um, does those apply to what the New Testament talks about when it comes to grace. So let's define grace first. Grace means free favor. Free favor. A favor done without any kind of expectation of return. A free favor, a gift. God's free favor. It's just a gift. It's doing something out of the generosity of your own heart with nothing in return expected. That's what God did for us. So that by God's grace, Jesus came to live among us. By God's grace, Jesus lived a sinless life. By God's grace, Jesus died on the cross. By God's grace, he spent three days in the grave. It's by God's grace that he rose from the dead. Free favor from God to you and I. And we see it in salvation. We see it when forgiveness and freedom is given. Forgiveness and freedom is given. So when I see the word grace in the New Testament, I always think free favor, because that's just a little more descriptive for me. Ephesians chapter 2 makes it very clear that it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. So that grace, that gift idea, that free favor, is how we come into a relationship with God. It's that grace, that free favor, that gift, that our sins are forgiven. That's why it's not about works. It's not about earning anything. It's simply about receiving something, receiving grace. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I was having a conversation this week with Jeff, and uh, Jeff was telling me, about a time he received grace, unearned free favor, a gift. Jeff was telling me that he was traveling across country from the East Coast back this way, and he had to go to Arizona in order to get one of his, uh, his cancer treatments, right? But he was going to arrive in Arizona a full week before his cancer treatment was available. And so he didn't have a place to stay. You can imagine trying to spend a, like a week in a hotel in Phoenix. I mean, that sounds pretty horrible. And so a distant friend of the family, just a friend of the family named Sally, offered up an empty house to him. An empty house to him. Huh, you just, if you're going to be here for a week, you come, you stay in this empty house. It won't cost you anything. You just crash there. You be at home. It, it'll be far more relaxing than some kind of hotel. Just let me take care of you. That's grace. That's a free favor. How beautiful is that? When Jeff told me that story, it reminded me of, a, of an event in my own life. I had a friend named Bob who got expelled out of high school. He got kicked out of high school, suspended. He earned it. In the process of getting expelled, expended, his... Uh, Let's just say his dad overreacted and kicked him out. So not only does he get kicked out of high school, <coughs> poor Bob, but he is also homeless. So here we have a homeless, troubled teen. And my friend Dean, Dean's parents took Bob in. We got a spare room. You come stay with us. 
And Bob stayed there for a year? For a year. He got back into school. He eventually went into the army. He's airborne, was airborne. Can you imagine having a teenage boy in your house and having a teenage delinquent that needs a place to stay and inviting the teenage delinquent into your house to sleep in the bedroom next to your good son? Now that is grace. Free favor. They didn't ask anything from Bob. Anything at all. And kept him out of getting into a whole lot more trouble. A whole lot more trouble. Bob. For some reason, the examples of grace and free favor seem to always connect to hospitality. I imagine that's probably the easiest example for us all. Can you think of a time where someone was gracious, gave you free favor in your life? Maybe a time you experienced unearned, unexpected hospitality that really met a need? That's an example of grace then in your life. Or maybe you were an instrument of grace by showing that kind of hospitality to somebody unearned and unexpected. So God worked in and through your life and used you as his instrument to free favor. Maybe that changed somebody's life. What a beautiful thing. Grace. We are only here because of God's grace. Praise the Lord. Second Peter. Second Peter says this. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, there's that word, both now and to the day of eternity. Grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So just in in case you think that having received grace, you're good. I have some bad news for you. Second Peter has an present active imperative command. I just went all grammar geek on you. That's okay. You were thinking about kittens. Um, Grow is a command we are supposed to obey every day. So every day you and I get a chance to either obey or rebel against the word. The word says every day we are to choose to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So every day we're supposed to be growing in grace and knowledge. That's leveling up. That's the spiritual maturity process. That's growing in intimacy with the Lord and growing in applied faith to our lives. Growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord. And that implies relationship and application. Stretching those muscles, as it were, and doing something awesome. Grow in grace. It's all connected, my friends. Have you received God's grace? The gift has been offered to you. Forgiveness of your sins, evil and wickedness. All you have to do is receive it. A free favor. For by grace you have been saved through faith. If that's not you, receive that gift now. Because we're not guaranteed the ride home. Accept it now. And have that transformation before another heartbeat goes by. Because your life may end today and you may face judgment before you have another chance. Surrender to God's grace. And then for us who have received God's grace, whether it was last week, last decade, or last millennia, are you growing in grace? Are you growing in grace? Or are you stagnant in grace? Let us be full of grace. Like Jesus Christ. Full of grace, full of truth. We've looked at glory, we've looked at grace. Now let's look at truth, my friends. Let's define it like anything else. Whoops, push buttons. Full of truth. This is not the word. 
Logos, which is divine, absolute truth. That's one kind of truth. Jesus is Logos, the Word, the absolute divine truth. This is the truth of reality. How it really is. Reality. Reality, straightforwardness, sincerity. It's, it's the truth of the idea, as it were. It's the truth of facts um, versus superstition and falsehood. The reality. We need to have a truthful view of reality. I believe some crazy things, my friends. I believe that God created the universe and the huge expanse of light and space. He created it in six days. I believe he created the smallest atoms and cells, electrons and neutrons, at the same time in six glorious days of Genesis chapter 1. I believe that the physical universe that we experience now is inferior to the invisible spiritual universe. I think the invisible spiritual universe is more real than the physical universe that we are experiencing now. Because I believe that there are angels and demons. I believe there is an invisible God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And he has a real enemy, Satan, the devil, who is trying to destroy us because we belong to the other side. That's reality and that's truth. And from a non-biblical, non-Christian point of view, that's insane. Because I believe in the invisible. But it's only insane if the invisible is not real. If the invisible is real. And if you don't believe in the invisible reality of God, heaven, hell, angels, and the devil, you have been deceived. Galatians chapter 2 verse 5 talks about truth and the truth of the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ only makes sense in a true understanding of reality, that there is the physical universe and the spiritual universe. The devil wins if he can get you to deny that. Satan, the devil, is the father of lies according to John chapter four verse, uh, John chapter 8 verse 44. And the devil, Satan, is trying to convince us of things that are not true. If he can make you believe a lie about yourself, he has sidelined you. If he can make you believe a lie about yourself, he has taken a soldier off of the field. If he can make you believe a lie about yourself and your life, if you buy into the lie of the enemy, he has won a small battle. That's what he's about. That's what he's about. And you and I both know that the greatest lies we believe are lies about ourselves and our own life. We believe lies like we are unworthy. We believe lies like what I do does not matter. We believe lies that my life can't make an impact for eternity. We believe lies that your job, your family, and your retirement is more important than heaven, hell, and the millions and millions of people who will die and be punished for all eternity because we didn't put our priorities straight. The lies that we believe, my friends, take us off the field. All because we don't believe the truth, the reality, that you are a child of God and that you are special and you are destined for greatness. Greatness. Remember, and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. That's the truth of reality. The physical universe and the spiritual universe. Who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for you. It's liberating. Because all of a sudden you have a proper perspective. You know what's truly valuable. And you can step up and you can do it, my friends. Liberty. 
if you don't buy into the truth, you aren't free. Too many voices are complaining about worrying that Washington, D.C. is taking away our freedoms when we have surrendered our freedoms to the devil because we reject the truth of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, but because I speak the truth, you don't believe me. It's one thing to believe lies about yourself that's just crippling. Jesus' example to us is he was a man of integrity. And we need to be people of integrity who speak the truth, even if the people around us don't believe it. To be a person of integrity now is to be a superhero. You want to make a radical, radical difference from the people around you? You be a person of integrity in a world of lies. People don't even care if you're a person of integrity. The lawyers have cinched it up. Lawyers and accountants make integrity meaningless. You do not have to be a person of your word because I will just sue you. We don't even expect a person to be a person of their word. So it's easy to say anything, to agree to anything, because none of it matters. And if you want to be different, you'll stand up and you'll speak the truth. We lie because it's convenient. We lie to defend ourselves so we don't get hurt. We lie to make ourselves look good. But to say the truth when it makes us look bad, to say the truth when it causes us pain and suffering, that's doing something Jesus-like. And that requires a higher level of spirituality than most believers have. I like hunting. And I went waterfowl hunting right there on the border of the Arctic Ocean. And we went and shot geese, lesser Canadians, as they came in from the water onto shore to feed at dawn. And mixed in with the lesser Canadians is a bird you've never heard of called brant, B-R-A-N-D-T, brant. Um, they have a little white triangle on them. And brant are just fantastic. You can only hunt them, I think, in two places in the world. One's in Mexico and one's in Alaska. And you're allowed to shoot two a day, two brant a day. And I went waterfowl hunting with two 12-year-old boys. Um, let's call them John and Nate. So geese are flying in, me and two 12-year-old boys. The geese are low. We are excited. Shotgun shells are going off. It's like the enemy's attacking us with a, you know, a bombs. We're just blowing things out of the sky. Birds are falling. We're very excited. Then the birds all disappear, like waterfowl tend to disappear. And we start gathering up the birds we have dropped. There's three of us. How many brant can we have? Six. We find seven. Seven brant have been killed. One over the limit. Fish and Wildlife will confiscate everything that we own on this trip. They will take my truck. They will take our guns. We will not be able to hunt for a very long time, not to mention the fines. But they will confiscate everything that we have. I'm with two 12-year-old boys. There's just the three of us at the end of the um, wilderness there. I see a teaching moment. I go all dad on them. Uh-oh. All right, we know what's at stake. What do we do, boys? What do we do? Nate says, push that one in the mud. Gone. We only have six. Smart boy. He's, yeah, he's going places. John said, Let's first breast it out. Let's not waste, waste the meat. Cut the meat off and then push the carcass into the uh, mud. You know, he, just, he didn't want to waste any of the meat. Uh, he's going places, right? All right, yeah. Not one of them suggested being a man of integrity. So I suggested, well, how about we do the above and beyond right thing? 
and let's gather up all our birds, go back to the truck, drive into town, and our, the head of the Fish and Wildlife Law Enforcement, his name was Rick, said, we'll go to Rick and we'll tell him what we did. Ranger Rick, yeah. The boys were freaked out. I don't want to lose my gun. I don't want to lose my waders. I'm losing a truck. I don't know what they were talking about. You know, who's going to get the $10,000 fine? It's going to be me. So we go back. Um, we're, we're in my house, and I call Rick up at home. I call him at home. Rick, this is what we did. We're guilty. You tell us what to do. We will do it. The boys are like shaking. I'm shaking. I didn't tell my wife. You know, <clears throat> that's why I'm shaking. Rick says this, well, those rules are really to prevent poaching. And obviously what you did is an accident. So you did the right thing by telling me, no consequences, have a good day. I was blown away. I actually went, are you sure, Rick? That doesn't, um, you know, uh, it's like, yep, no problem, no problem at all. You don't want me to bring you the bird? No, no, it's all good. Okay, thank you, Ranger Rick. Boys, did we learn a good lesson, right? Um, I don't know if it had a long-term effect on them or not, but I sure hope it did. Imagine an opportunity then to speak the truth. To speak the truth by saying I am guilty. To speak the truth that had severe consequences. To speak the truth that affected others with negative consequences. I'm just glad that story worked out. <laughs> truth. We don't live in a culture of truth anymore, and we haven't for decades and decades and decades. We're comfortable with lies. We're so comfortable with lies that the truth makes us uncomfortable. If somebody says they're going to be there at 10 o'clock, we're shocked when they're there at 10 o'clock. It just amazes us. When somebody says they're going to do something and they don't do it, it's normal. Instead of being men and women of truth. The Holy Spirit is described not only as a member of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who applies all this stuff, but according to John chapter 14, verse 7, and 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of truth who counsels, instructs, and guides us. You know where the Spirit is leading you if the Spirit is leading you in truth. You know where the enemy is leading you if he's leading you in lies. Let lying be so uncomfortable that you view it as cancer. That it'll eat your living cells and destroy you from within. And let's be so embracing of truth and integrity that our children, our employees... Our friends and family will say, well, you know what? You may not like this person for some reason, but they're a person of integrity. You can trust and believe everything that person says. They say they'll do it, they'll do it. Isn't that what we want our children and grandchildren to grow up to be? And yet we surrender integrity to the father of lies. And then we wonder when we try to speak truth to the next generation, they don't believe us because we've lost our integrity. We've lost our integrity. May the Holy Spirit guide and direct us, counsel and instruct.